The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. I have got Greg Roberg here back from Ag Direct to talk about what's going on in the world of, I guess, ag lending, I guess, is the best way to do that. So, Greg, how you doing, man? I'm good. Casey, good to see you. How good are you? you too. I'm doing good, man. Things are plugging along here well, well. We got some snow this morning, so you know, what, else, what more could you ask for, right? Yeah, old man winter is not letting go of his group just yet, is he? No, it's a uh, second winter out here, you know, in in the Western Panhandle. We've got uh, we still got April and May to go yet before winter's done. So, um, we get this we get this abbreviate somewhere in the middle where it feels like spring and everyone gets tricked, and then yeah. we have a blizzard or two yet to go. So we'll, yeah. we'll be good. We should, we'll be plugging along there. So. Probably could use the moisture. We definitely could use the moisture. No doubt about there. No doubt about that. All right, Greg. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. So. Starting to see some some abbreviation a little bit on some interest rates. Um, I went out to your website and looked around, and there's some stuff out there for that stuff over two hundred thousand dollars, where you're looking at some, um, you know, six point eight five percent interest yeah. rates. You know, this time last year, a lot of guys are signing notes at seven and a half or eight percent interest rates. So there is some opportunity there where you're starting to see some breaks in the uh, interest rates. That where if you're thinking about doing something, this might be a good time to do that. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that, Casey. Yeah, we've seen some relief anywhere from, you know, half a percent, maybe upwards of 75 basis points, three yeah. quarters of a percent. So it, it feels a lot better to have rates in the sixes. Yeah. And especially on bigger equipment, you can get rates in the sixes, you know, six, yeah. six, eight, five, that, that's our best rate. You know, it's a large, larger deal. The, the salesman gives us a call and sometimes we can sharpen the pencil and get a little bit lower than that. But also, by and large, the market is saying, you know, really good rates somewhere between six and a half and six, nine. Yeah. Kind of depending on who the lender is. Yep. So that feels good because it's like to go a little bit of optimism that maybe we've hit the peak. Yep. Now we're kind of coming down a little bit. Everybody wants to get back in those fives. It wasn't more yeah. than probably what a couple years ago, two and a half years ago, it was three and a half percent. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If we'll see that anytime soon, I would say probably not. Mm-hmm. You know, I think fives are in our future again. I don't know if that's in 24, if we'll have to wait till 25. That meets again here coming up in March. They meet eight times a year. Um, right now, there's about a 90% chance of kind of the experts that look at that that say, that's just going to hold steady. Yeah. And everything you read is pretty much you're going to hold steady. So they look at jobs report, they look at inflation, they just kind of get a gauge of how the economy is doing. Yeah. So as we kind of look into our crystal ball and using some of the experts, it looks like possibly in June would be the most likely cut. And personally, I, I would call it 50-50 if that happens or not. Typically, the Fed doesn't do a lot in election year. And I think Chairman Powell is yeah. going to be very cautious in in cutting rates until he feels really good that inflation's at 2%. She said, is he's starting at or near 2%. So I guess my personal opinion would be is that's a 50-50. But I feel a lot more confident going into the fourth quarter that we could see some interest rate relief. How much? You know, maybe a quarter, a couple times. So hopefully by Christmas, we could be down another half a percent. So it could be maybe in those low sixes. So that's my best guess today. I did yeah. want to mention, though, we've seen a, a pop or an increase in leasing. Yeah, which that was is my next the question was the leasing. Yeah. Talk about and, that a little bit. Yeah, so we're having a good year so far, and I direct it over early into it as we record this year in early March or mid-March. Um, appreciate everybody's support, uh, farmers and dealers uh, taking advantage of, of ag direct, whether it be a loan product or a lease product. But our leasing is up over thirty, over thirty-seven percent actually uh, for January, February compared to a year ago. Wow! And I think you know we kind of anticipated that just because prices of equipment doesn't come down. And, you know, there's still strong demand for for new as well as late model good used equipment. And I think a lot of folks are kind of looking at what commodity prices are doing. They want to upgrade equipment. They're so really looking at cash flow. Yeah. You know, what kind of payment can I afford? And Ag Direct's most popular lease is what we call lease to own. And so it could be a pro or a put. That's kind of a fancy acronym, but basically it's a lease to own. You lease it. You can trade it if you want. You can buy out the residual when the time comes. You have all kinds of different options. And so we've really seen an increase there. Probably as far as an asset, I'd say it's mostly on tractors. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like tractors are still moving around. There's a lot of tractors to pick from. There's plenty of real yeah. tractors out there to go to go find what you're looking for. But um, as you start, as we start kind of looking at this, you know, we're in those typical peak selling cycles right now. So we got that ahead of spring harvest and spring planting, those kind of things where people are making decisions about mm-hmm. what it is they're going to be doing as they move forward in the year. And, as, and, you know, we're in that phase right now, especially you start with the stuff like sprayers and those kind of things. Those are the mm-hmm. kind of the first to go. And we've got some people making some decisions on, on planters and those kind of things as, as use planters and those kind of things as we head into planting season. Um, I guess one question I'll ask you, Greg, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. But as you're looking at your, um, your portfolio, are you seeing more people come to you with with uh, more frequency when it comes to saying, hey, you know, I'm starting to look at some of these upgrade kits that are out there, whether it's on the deer side or the precision side, um, sprayer, planter upgrades and stuff like that? Are you seeing some of that kind of peak a little bit where you're seeing more of that traffic come your way? A little bit. I would yeah. say, it's, well, I'll say it's significant, but, yeah, it certainly gets a little bit more year, year over year, especially yeah. if you have an older toolbar. I mean, you can outfit a planter. A yeah. bar might be 20 years old. You know those cases as well as anybody. Um, you can make that planter almost as functional as a, as a new planter yeah. with all the different technologies. So we do that at AgDirect. We like to get the whole asset. Um, we will do technology, but it's usually like a three-year loan, and sometimes those payments will be a bit more than what folks want. So if we can get the toolbar or the main asset, 
you know, you could go up to five years or maybe even beyond that. So it makes those payments a little bit more manageable. So certainly seeing an uptick, especially when you look at 10 years back, it's really uh, increased a lot, but it just seems to be a little bit more incrementally uh, year after year. But as uh, folks look at cash flow, that might be an option that they look at instead of trading for something newer, they may need to just modify or upgrade what they have. But, you know, now's a great time. You talk about inventory levels, you know, yeah. I would say most dealers would say we're caught up, you know, manufacturers are caught up and we may even have a few different types of extra combines or extra tractors that need to find a new home. So yep. that's really changed pretty quickly just in the last 12 months from um, maybe not having all the inventory that the dealer wanted to having pretty much everything that they want ready to sell. So if you're looking to buy equipment, I would say now's a really good time to upgrade because yeah. your dealers should have quite a bit of selection. If they don't have what they have, if they don't have what you want, I bet they could find it. Yeah. If they don't have what you want, you got to start asking some questions because there should be plenty, plenty of everything going around for everybody. So yeah. um, real quick, Greg, as you look out across the uh, spectrum now, you just talked about how great 24 started for Ag Direct. As you're looking on, do you see any stumbling blocks ahead of you guys that you were kind of worried about a little bit? Yeah, you know, certainly the corn and bean prices. Yeah, that's absolutely. a big, yeah. big concern of ours because our success is tied directly to dealers and, and farmers' success. And so we're seeing a lot of corn prices, cash corn that starts with a three. That doesn't make yeah. anybody feel real good, I guess, unless maybe you're uh, a protein producer and, and you're sure. buying corn. That probably helps you with your profit margins. But if you're producing corn and beans, uh, you'd much rather see that start with a, a five. So yep. that, like, that's likely the biggest headwind out there right now. Biggest concern for all of us that are in this industry. So we'll have to see how that plays out. So far, I think there's just a lot of cash in the market. And from some really profitable years in farming. So folks that want to upgrade or maybe they ordered something and it's it's in, something new that's in, um, it seems like the uh, the pace of equipment, at least through the first couple of months from what our vantage point and already start March is very similar to what 23 was. So, um, you know, we kind of, at Big Walker right now, case you to be kind of that August, September time frame. You know, right. do we get rain where we need it? Do we get any kind of, Bumping commodity prices to make us sure. all feel a little bit better uh, yep. come August. So we're yep. going to continue to do our best to win business here in March and April. Those are big months for anybody that's financing or leasing equipment. And then uh, kind of see what the summer and early fall bring. Right on, Greg. Well, it's always good to have you on, man. If folks want to reach out to you, get more information about what you're doing over to Ag Direct, what's the best way to do that? couple best ways you can go to us at agdirect.com you can see our rates you can apply through agdirect.info if you are looking at buying something even if you're buying at a dealer and you want to just get approved ahead of time go ahead and do that um we can always uh work with whatever dealer you choose so that's agdirect.com we'd love to hear from you call us at we're here to help right on greg appreciate you being on we'll catch you again next time Looking forward to it. Thanks, Casey. Hello, and welcome to Moving Our Podcast. I've got Tanner M. Key back from CoBank, and he's here to talk about what's going on in the world of ag economics. Tanner, how you doing, bud? I am wonderful, Casey. Thanks for having me back again. It's always a pleasure, sir. Not much to talk about. I don't know what we're going to cover today. There's not, not much going on in the world of ag right now. but There's plenty going on. <laughs> plenty there's, going on. There's, there's more stuff going on than I can, I think, than I've uh, ever seen happened you know this early into a planning season where the weather and where we're at right now and the amount of uh warm weather and the amount of stuff coming out of dormancy this early in uh, uh in the year is really setting the stage where if something if there were to have a, a cold snap come through one night where it got down to you know into the 20s in, in wheat country we could have a serious <laughs> problem uh oh, with yes. what we're seeing there so i guess you know as you're looking around tanner what are some of the th- what are some of the pressures that you're seeing right now in the marketplace um, as we start looking at, um, you know, how the funds are record short? We've got, um, you know, yeah. obviously the geopolitical stuff going on around the world. We've got um, situations that we see um, with, uh, with overall on-farm income for 24. So I guess you tell me where you want to start at and we'll, we'll go down the rabbit hole. Well, you cover a lot on your other episodes, but we'll just touch on grain prices right now. Okay. That's, that's an obvious problem. Um, because we've got no shortage of uh, supply as it is right now. Our corn stocks as of December 1st are still um, at multi-year highs or were multi-year highs. We're going to have uh, stocks here reported at the end of March. Uh, we'll have an update on that. But you know that's really the main driver here. 
and uh, you've got big stocks here in the U.S., big big crop coming down in uh, South America. I think we've probably overplayed the story on Brazil's drought. We've underplayed the story of what's going on in Argentina. And uh, Argentina's crop is rebounding. It's going to be double what it was last year. And uh, Brazil is going to have a smaller crop. But all when you add that together, that's a, still a lot of corn. So probably going to be a record-sized crop in addition to the record crop that we had here. So the fundamentals just aren't there, Casey, uh, to turn this turn the story around on prices. And corn is going to be the driver. Corn is king, right? Mm-hmm. It's a big reason why we're uh, down where we're at on wheat prices. You know, we had a smaller world wheat crop uh, this past year. But remember, we had big carry-in stocks from last year, especially over in the Black Sea region with Russia having a record crop prior year and then another big crop this year. And then you've got uh, cheap corn competing with wheat into the feed channel. And then on top of all this, you got a strong dollar. There's nothing bullish about anything going on right now. Right. So as to the funds, what's going on there? Why are they so short? They're record short in some cases. The funds are laying on some very heavy short positions. Why? Because... Short positions right now make money. Owning a commodity, owning a grain is going to be a very painful experience when you are in surplus with a strong dollar. So there's just not any case here uh, for the funds to to try to challenge this story. So what what are they going to do? They're going to follow the trend. And that's what funds do. we got to remember the funds and their strategy. The, The funds are trend followers. And so they've been laying on some very heavy short positions. We've been following this in CoBank because our concern is what happens when the funds unwind these heavy short positions. Well, you could get a repeat of what you see perhaps in something like Tesla. If you remember, uh, like it's been a couple of years ago when the Tesla stock was going was on fire. It's because all these short holders had to get out of their positions. They were losing way too much money, and they were willing to pay any price on stock to get out of their shorts. And so now people are wondering, well, are we going to be in the same position with grains where if the the funds have to unwind all these short positions, are we going to see a sharp rally in grains? And that would be of consequence to our co-op customers because they are going to own long, they're going to be long the physical commodity short in the futures. And so they would have to pay margin calls all the way up, which can be a very painful experience. We have a lot of uh, bad memories of what happened when Russia invaded Ukraine Commodity prices uh, rose uh, quite sharply. Wheat went from seven bucks, fourteen bucks, uh, in short order, and so the funds had to carry or had to pay margin calls all the way up. Okay, and so now people are wondering: Are we going to see a repeat of that when you put, when you have the funds so heavily short? Right now, we just don't see it. Like I said, we've got a lot of commodity. Uh, here in the U.S. and around the world, especially in South America, especially over in Russia. We have a strong dollar. The weather right now uh, over in Russia for their crop is quite good. Uh, their their crop is in good shape. Here in the U.S., uh, we've got an improved situation on the plains where the crop doesn't, where the wheat crop doesn't look nearly as bad. I will ha- say, however, we've got a concerning situation in the Midwest as we head into planting season. It's a little dry, especially in parts of northeast Iowa. Uh, and the surrounding areas. But we're still a long ways yet uh, till we put a seed in the ground in the Midwest, and it's not really a dire situation. So uh, as it is right now, there's no real reason to be very concerned and no real reason for the market to be laying in a lot of risk premium. Okay, Because, again, the supply and demand fundamentals just don't paint any bullish story whatsoever. <laughs> it's a very low-risk situation as it is right now. On supply. Uh, what about demand? Uh, demand uh, is growing, especially for soybeans, uh, when you have all this expanded crush capacity to meet the needs of renewable diesel. Clearly, there's a bullish story there, right? Well, there again, we still have a strong dollar. We're still competing against a record crop down in South America. It's really hard to find the bullish case there, even though we have a very strong demand story uh, that continues to grow here in the United States. So however you want to look at it uh, right now, in case the fundamentals just aren't there, but that I see at any rate uh, for corn, wheat, and soybean prices to turn around. But of course, we're always just one missile launch attack away from some geopolitical event around the world to cause markets or to cause the funds to exit those short positions and go to cash or go to treasuries as a safe haven. And doing that or exiting those positions would 
probably cause a pretty sharp. So anyway, I'll let you uh, figure out how uh, what's going to happen in the future with those situations. But anyway, <laughs> okay. supply demand fundamentals just aren't there. And until we see a concerning situation unfold with weather or a concerning situation unfold geopolitically, um, we're probably going to be down here on prices. Right on. Okay. All right. So this is the time of the year when the perspective planting report comes out, people kind of fill a survey out and kind of say, hey, this is what we're going to plant and this is what we're not going to plant type of things. Looking at what's going on, I mean, last year we planted 94 million acres of corn. What's your thoughts on what's that mix might look like? What might be some winners? What might be some losers and acres when you start looking at uh, where prices are and then, you know, going into planting season? Yeah, great question. Obviously, with <coughs> corn prices flirting with a three handle, that's going to take the wind out of uh, corn acreage. And USDA has put their number at 91 million. I'm not so certain about that. Uh, it could be up, you know, up around 91 to 92. Uh, still down from last year's acreage uh, by a fair amount. But I I don't know. There's a lot of momentum behind corn. I think sometimes people get a little overly um, optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, I think corn is one of those crops that tends to hold its acres fairly well just because farmers like to grow it, and there's a, there's always a market for it. Uh, fertilizers, fertilizer prices are down from last year, and corn is the big user of fertilizer. So I think that might perhaps uh, soften the uh, uh, the margins a little bit, make the margins less painful for planting corn. And then I think we've got a little optimistic on soybeans because obviously we talked about uh, renewable diesel, but we've still got a lot of imports coming into the U.S. replacing soybean oil. We've got a lot of canola oil coming in from Canada. We've got palm oil coming in from uh, Southeast Asia. We've got uh, tallow coming in from other areas. Uh, all of that is flowing into renewable diesel and competing with uh, soybean oil. And so that kind of takes away that thesis that we've got to have uh, a lot of soybean acres in this country. We, we haven't really uh, taken into account those record large imports. And then same thing for exports, uh, strong dollar, record crop down in South America, a weakening demand over in China because their economic situation and their hog mar- feeding margins are, are not looking good. Uh, their crush margins, soybean crush margins in China have been negative. So there's a thesis there that's hard to make about demand. You know, it's it's going to be weaker demand for U.S. soybeans overseas. And at the same time, we've got all these record imports coming into the U.S., competing with uh, soybean oil as uh, feedstock for renewable diesel. So I think that kind of takes the wind out of the sails a little bit for soybeans. So USDA is putting their number at soybeans at uh, what, 87 and a half. Yeah, more probably around 86 and a half to 87 on acres for soybeans, uh, me personally. I'm still counting on an expansion of acreage. I just don't see it as, as bullish as, the, as USDA does. And then wheat uh, is probably going to lose a little bit. And, uh, you know, that may... I think that I think those acres are probably uh, going to go to some al- other alternative crops. Um, you know, maybe the you know, wheat might pick up uh, or lose some acres to soybeans and corn. But wheat right now is a real dog. It's it's a real tough story to plant wheat right now, and so I think uh, spring wheat acres are probably going to lose out. And then at the same time, we may see more graze out of winter wheat because cattle prices are high. Wheat prices are in the tank. The the economics of running a combine over a winter wheat crop right now just start looking good. And so I think you'd probably see some increased graze out uh, with livestock uh, this uh, into the spring. And so that's going to reduce uh, harvested acres on uh, winter wheat. And I think cotton is probably going to pick up a little bit more, too. Cotton prices have really come up. Uh, here recently, and I think that's going to pull acres, and that'll probably pull some acres out of corn. So, you know, I think uh, I don't know how you know, how much that would be, uh, half a million up to a million, uh, something like that. So, at any rate, when you add all that together, I think you know, I think the markets are still trying to. You know, the markets will continue to be in competition for acres. I think the USDA is going to find out those numbers are going to shift a little, shift around a little bit between now and prospective plantings. It's going to be interesting to watch how that plays out because, you know, this this is as you look out into 24 and kind of economically thinking, speaking and all those things where on-farm income is staged to be based on where commodity prices are. And you look at futures and those kind of things where those are going to be at. We have seen a, a big pullback on um, input costs as far as what they were comparatively, what they've been in the last couple of years. So there's a, yeah. a little bit of a silver lining there, but I guess. As you look at your crystal ball here out in the 24, 
What's your thoughts about how 24 is going to play out going into 25? Well, we're going to need to see a turnaround in commodity prices. And right now, there's just no story for that. And as as long as we're going to be down here and uh, with production costs still fairly resilient, like we just mentioned, um, fertilizer prices come back a little bit compared to last year. Uh, and fuel prices as well, and that's that's been a big benefit. Uh, but land prices still high, right. cash rents still high, machinery prices you you know about that. Yeah. And, I, and there may be some softening going on there, but it's you know the cost of production story is always slow to catch up with what happens to commodity prices. And so what's going to happen is you're going to see a big erosion of net farm income. USDA is projecting a 25 percent drop from last year. It's not going to be until 2025 until I think your major inputs like uh, land and machinery and labor and things like that finally kind of come into alignment. So it's going to be a couple of years probably of uh, some real compressed margins. And you know, you'll start to see it first probably in cash rents uh, where cash rents start to be negotiated and or renegotiated rather. And farmers go to their landlords and say, look, this these numbers just are pencil. Maybe you can get a better deal from somebody else, but I ha- highly doubt it. Can we renegotiate this rent down to something that's a little bit more workable. And so that'll probably be a conversation that if that doesn't happen this year, it's definitely going to happen next year. That will That is a conversation that's going to happen next year where, where cash rents start coming down and then land rents are probably going to follow by because that's kind of the, it's easier to renegotiate a cash rent than it is to try to renegotiate a, the land and the bid on the land, right? Once it's bought, it's bought. And uh, you've got a lot of carryover income from last year that's supporting land values. So it's going to be the cash rents that uh, that are going to be the leading indicator there, I think. So heading into next year, uh, keep an eye on cash rents and uh, land values are probably going to plateau this year and start to drop would be my idea. Uh, but you know, like I said, it, it, it takes a little bit for these costs to finally catch up to commodity markets. Well, I think we'll, we'll, we'll start to see those things really turn uh, next year. Let's look at go interest rates. Talk about that a little bit as you as you look at that. Uh, the Fed said they were going to lower. Well, they didn't really say that. They hinted that they were going to lower interest rates three times. Yes. Everyone's kind of thinking that maybe this June, July time frame will be uh, when they do that. I guess as you're looking at that, say we do drop the interest rates three quarters of a point to one. Do you think the, Do you think they'll do? I guess. Yeah. I guess the question I'm asking is, do you feel like the Fed is in a place where they're going to start lowering rates, or do you feel like the Fed is in a place where they're just going to kind of wait and see what happens with what they're doing? Because, you yes. know, I mean, for as high as interest rates are compared yeah. to what they were, I mean, it hasn't really hurt the economy like they thought it was going to. Yeah, Jay Powell's the latest comments were, are they're still in it. Um, right. they, they, they've they still, you know, they're waiting for inflation to come down. They haven't uh, committed to doing it. To, to, to cutting rates at a certain period of time, and when you look at the hirings out there, the job the, or the job hirings and job openings, those are still growing. Um, inflation is not down to their desired level of two percent; they're still above three, uh, and you still have an economy that just doesn't give up right now. And so, you know, it, it's it's hard to see the Fed committing to cutting rates at a certain point in time when you still have the the data points coming in saying inflation is still alive. It's weakened, it's down, but it's still above their desired level. And uh, the latest numbers coming in from their surveys, uh, the economy are indicating that perhaps they don't, perhaps there's no rate cut uh, in June. Perhaps it'll be in the latter half of the year. It might not be three, it might be two, it might be one. Uh, the Fed does not want to back themselves into a corner and say yes, we're going to do this when the when the data may indicate that perhaps that may be a little premature. So, my bias, my personal bias, Casey, is it's not going to happen until the back half of the year. I think, given where we're at right now, and this is only March, we still got a right. couple. We still got, got some go, months yeah. to go before we get to June. Right. My thinking is that uh, they're still afraid of a repeat what happened in the 19th. And uh, what happened then is the, the Fed uh, cut rates too soon and inflation took off again. And then they had to get Paul Volcker, Paul Volcker uh, into the Fed to finally whip it. And uh, those are some very painful times. So my, my feeling is they're probably going to be a little bit slower than what they had into, what they had telegraphed back in December. They said three rate cuts in 2020. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I I don't think I don't I'm going to hold their fire on that. Yeah, I don't. I don't see three rate cuts in twenty four. Not not with the way the the economy has been reacting. Yeah, it's still it's too strong. Not, 
still stronger than what it's stronger than what it should be. I mean, for where it's at. So, I mean, if you listen to the talking heads, you know, so it's, uh, that's definitely going to be something to pay attention to. And at, at the end, that's a game changer. Again, kind of going back to, excuse me, going back to what you talked about, you know, earlier with uh, the price of, of commodities and then you throw interest rates on top of that coming down a little bit, that, that changes the spectrum of things. Well, but in a lot of cases, I mean, they've already set up, um, most, um, operations now have got their funding for the year. So they're whatever interest rate they're at now is what they're going right. to be at until 25. So they really wouldn't see anything transpire till 25 anyway. So. Right. Um, yeah. On their operating loans. Yeah. Then there's the issue of the dollar. Right. And that was and, the next question. Start talking about the dollar. We saw kind of have a little, take a little nick there. Um, got went lower um, earlier this week, but really the dollar has been pretty strong comparatively to where, yeah. where it's been at. So. Yeah. Historically it's still fairly strong. And yeah. Uh, that's what he, that's what you would expect that economy that still continues to grow uh, with a monetary policy or fiscal policy that is still uh, fairly tight. And so we've it's come down here over the last few days. But in the long term trend, when you go back to uh, like early twenty to back, you know, at that point or late twenty, well down, we're well below uh, that period. Uh, but historically speaking, when you go back uh, over the last say 10 years, the dollar is still fairly strong. And so I still consider it a strong dollar, even though it's still showing some signs of weakening. It's still historically fairly strong. And uh, that's going to be a headwind uh, to our exports. And, you know, if the if the Fed were to start cutting uh, interest rates, you know, that might weaken the value of the dollar. But uh it remains to be seen if that were to happen. And so I think we're just going to have to go with the story that as long as the U.S. economy is growing, we're going to have a strong dollar, and that's going to be a headwind to our exports, and that tends to be very bearish on commodities. Yep. So now that was the next thing I was going to bring up about exports. If you look at what China's been doing here of late, they, um, they've been coming to the table and they bought some stuff, but they've also canceled a lot of stuff too. So yes. I guess as you're looking at, at our export situation, currently where we're at right now, I guess, do you see any real glimmers of hope out there that, that are jumping out at you? Yeah, it's hard uh, to find that. I mean, right now you've got the uh, the Chinese government uh, are, uh, is trying to uh, replenish its state reserves, and so they're buying a lot of grains. So they're buying uh, a lot of sorghum. They're buying some corn. Uh, the cancellations on the wheat purchases surprised me. There's been three of them now in the last, yeah. you know, last week or so. Three big cancellations on soft wheat they made. And uh, so that was interesting. I'm assuming that they're switching those purchases over to probably Russia. Uh, Russian exports are still very competitive on price. And so that's, that, I would imagine that's what they're doing is they're they're canceling those purchases of U.S. soft wheat and moving it over to uh, the Black Sea, specifically Russia, uh, would be my guess. Um, just because their offers out of the Black Sea are so cheap compared to the U.S. But at the same time, you got the Chinese that are – uh, the Chinese government that is taking advantage of these uh, low corn prices and low sorghum prices to uh, stockpile. So that's not really a market-driven uh, decision. That's a political decision. And so the you know the Chinese government likes to stockpile uh, you know when commodities are lower, and that's what they're doing right now. But of course, they can change their they can change their uh, decision any time. They can cancel those <laughs> those purchases just like they can. Right. The so, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm a little uh, reluctant to, to put too much hope and faith uh, in the Chinese government and their political decisions on buying commodities. And once they yeah. change their mind, well, we're going to cancel it. That's right. Yeah, they're they're they are uh, they're actively doing some stuff. You know, they're always going to look at, at every place else before the United States first. Anyway, I mean, that's just what they're going to do. And then if yeah. they come to us. That's that's kind of a I'm going to use the word last resort, but it's it's a last resort in, in their mind. Yeah. I think. Uh, well, they're trying they, to build their relationships elsewhere. <clears throat> yeah, uh, for sure. For all the geopolitical reasons we all know about. Right. Yep. Um, probably the last thing I'd ask you here is, as we're looking at the world right now and the geopolitical stuff that we see happening, um, I guess any more influence right now geopolitically on the markets than, than you've seen, than what we've seen in the past has been kind of status quo. An election year. Obviously, yeah, that's true. So uh, a lot of focus on uh, and Biden, who are the current candidates, leading candidates. Yep. There's that may change. It is really old, or they're both. What are we talking about? No. Uh, so that yep. raises the risk of one of them leaving the race for health reasons. 
Right. Um, and then you've got uh, Biden or Trump with his uh, legal issues. So who knows? You never you never know. So they could be replaced. But as it is right now, there is that risk of what could happen uh, in an election time. We have the history of both presidents. We know what they how they both conduct themselves in regards to trade. Neither one of them are friends of trade. Uh, the only difference between Biden and Trump is that Trump was more aggressive on his trade protectionism and uh, you know, picking fights with trading partners. And so with that memory, if we have a Trump uh, election uh, this November, well, the markets could respond uh, to that. Uh, because to that fear of a renewed trade fights, trade wars. So there's that here in the U.S. I'd say that's probably the big one, the most likely one at this point in time. The Chinese is, are always kind of out there on the fringe of what's going to happen with the United States and China or if China were to invade Taiwan. Everybody always wants to know that. That's a crapshoot. Um, right. no, we already talked about that. If they did something like that, the funds would – like we talked about earlier, would exit their their positions in grains and go to cash for safety. And that would cause a rally. Uh, but, you know, I think those are the main things that uh, are up in front of us that we that are certainties. There will be an election here in the United States. Sure. And a trade protectionist is going to be in the White House. The question is how, how severe is the trade protectionism? Right. That's the question. Yeah. And I think the markets are going to be following that. Yep, for sure. All right, man. Probably a good place to stop there, Tanner. If folks want to reach out to you and you know get more information about what you're doing, what's the best way to do that? Well, you can always go to our website, Cobank. Uh, they've got all of our uh, information there on the website, and then there's always a, all, all of our uh, reports that we produce are on the website as well. Yep. Tanner, appreciate you being on, man, and we'll uh, catch you again next time. Sounds good. Thanks, Casey. Right on. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast and check out the video version of this over on the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. You can also go to that same handle on TikTok and uh, what's up? Snapchat. You can go there too. It's not like any TikTok's about ready to get axed from the United States anyway. So. <laughs> Check it out while you can. <clears throat> check it out while you can. So go to movingironllc.com for everything Moving Iron related and check out the uh, Moving Iron Summit coming up here in uh, Nashville in uh, November 4th through the 6th. So check that out. Uh, information will be up there very soon for that. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Tanner Amke. It's Smooth Smart, folks. Out. The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data, it's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. Find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is proudly provided by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century. 
Moving.